Let's take a look at homework that we had last night, guys. Page 538, questions number 1 to 10. Any issues with those questions? Number 9, I know we have, because uh, a number of people already told me about number 9. Any others? Patrick? Sorry? 10? Okay, we got 9, we got 10. 7B, did I hear? William? Yep. We got number 1, 7B, 9, and 10. Anya? 3B. Okay, going once. Going twice. Okay, 1, 3B, 7, 7B, uh, 9, and 10. Number 1 says, identify two factors that influence the force of electrostatic attraction or repulsion acting on two charges. Write a mathematical relationship uh, expression to describe the relationship. Uh, you know what? This is, uh, if you had trouble with this question, it's more of a, oh, okay, that's what they mean kind of thing, as opposed to, you don't know the answer. I guarantee you, everybody in the room knows the answer to this question, okay, if you know exactly what they're getting at here, okay? Um, who has the answer? Travis? Yeah, it's distance and charge, right? What are the two things that, that affect it? It's the distance separating the two charges, and it's the values of the charges. And what's the mathematical expression? Well, it's Coulomb's law. F is equal to kq1, q2 over r squared. Now, Travis, the easy way to determine what two factors it is that affect that relationship is to look at the equation, right? Do the second part of the question first. Write down the equation, and then look at that equation and say, oh, it's got to be charge, and it's got to be distance that separates the charge that affect that relationship. You don't have to come up with that in your head. Look at the equation and determine from the equation what it is that affects it. All right, 3B. Uh, by the way, uh, some of you sometimes uh, in the past have had people ask them the question, what does SI mean? What does what SI mean? It, it's, it stands for System International. I can't, I, can't, I can't say that with the right French accent, but, but that's what it stands for in French. System, system, however you say it, international. Okay, it's the metric system, basically. Uh, and the metric system units for electric charge are the coulombs. Uh, question B, that's the one that we really want to do here. Compare the charge of an electron to that produced by rubbing an ebonite rod with fur. Now, in terms of values, we can't do that. Okay, we don't know the exact value of the charge produced when you rub uh, ebonite with fur, but we know that there's going to be a lot of electrons transferred when you rub those two together, right? It's not going to be a single electron. You're going to get, compared to the charge of an electron, a massive amount of charge on the ebonite and on the fur. Basically, okay, if you take fur a, um, and it charges it and you can feel that charge or you can hear that discharge, or you take that ebonite and it will and it will attract, you guys have probably did this demonstration in Science 10, where you, when you uh, take a comb and rub it against something and then bring it close to the water, right? and, it, and it bends the water. Have you ever seen that? Try it at home. Okay, try it. R run a thin stream of water, okay, not dripping, but just barely not dripping. Okay, comb your hair, and then put the comb near the water and watch the water bend towards the comb, dramatically bend towards the comb. Okay, if you can see that much force of attraction, then there must be a lot of charge on it, compared, that is, to the charge of an electron. So all they're looking for here in question number three, 3B, that is, compare the charge of an electron to that cause when you rub these two things together. The charge here is much, much bigger. How much bigger? I don't know exactly, but much bigger. 7B, uh, two identical conducting spheres of this charge and this charge are in fixed positions two meters apart. doesn't say whether they're positive or negative, but it does say that they're identical, okay, which means that, um, well, actually it does say, by, by default, because it doesn't say negative 5.0, then they've got to be positive. They're identical, so they're both positive. We touch them together, and then we want to find the electrostatic force. So we touch them together, 5 plus 6 divided by 2 becomes 5.5. So both of the charges, Q1 and Q2, are 5.5 times 10 to the minus 5 coulombs. We want to find the force. It's going to be K times 5.5 times 10 to the minus 5 times 5.5 times 10 to the minus 5 divided by the distance 2.0, and then you've got to square that. Okay. Who had issues with question number 7B? Who asked about that? 
Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. What was the answer? 6.8? Anybody else get that? The answers, by the way, for all these check and reflect questions are in the back of the book. It's, it's in an appendix. So uh, if you ever want to check your own answers when you're doing your homework, just, just download that appendix. Uh, we have question number nine. That was the big one, it seemed. A helium nucleus has a positive charge with a magnitude twice that of a negative charge on the electron. Is the electrostatic force of attraction on the electron equal to the force acting on the nucleus? Yes or no? Forget about the justify your answer right now. Who says yes? Okay, the electron is orbiting around the nucleus. Who says the force on the electron is the same as the force on the nucleus? Okay, who says it's not? Okay. Okay, go ahead. No, no. No, no, it's talking about the force of the electron on the nucleus and the force of the nucleus on the electron. Okay, do you want to change your answer? Okay. The answer is they are the same because it's Newton's third law, right? If object A applies a force on object B, then object B will apply an equal and opposite force on object A. When we calculate that force, kq1, q2 over r squared, we're not finding the force on this one. Okay, we're finding the force on this one or this one, the force between the two, between the electron and the nucleus. And finally, number 10, this is a good question. Electrical forces are so strong that the combined electrostatic forces of attraction acting on all the negative electrons and the positive protons in your body could crush you to the thickness thinner than a piece of paper. Well, that's a happy thought. Why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't this happen? Travis? They're positive and negative repelling each other? Yeah, you have light charges repelling each other. Paige, is that what you're going to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Essentially, I mean, look at it this way. In an atom, in an atom, you have an equal number of protons and electrons, right? There will be attraction between each one of those electrons and each one of those protons, right? But there will also be a force of repulsion between each one of those protons and each one of those protons, and each one of those electrons and each one of those electrons. Essentially, the protons, the nuclei, repel each other. Okay, you got this big force of attraction, but you get this big force of repulsion. So what does the net force end up becoming? Zero. Okay, so you end up not compressing, or exploding, for that matter. Okay, if the force, was, the force of repulsion was too big, compared to the force of attraction, what would happen? You wouldn't compress to a piece of paper. You would, you would explode or become a, one of those sumo wrestler costumes or something like that. That doesn't happen either. Yeah, yeah. Quick question about number eight there. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear it, um, the units here for number eight, um, Matt, that's good that you're noticing that there's something different there. We always want to circle those, draw attention to those, right? We see an MC. An MC is a millicoulomb. A millicoulomb is what? 10 to the minus, sorry? A thousandth, yes. 10 to the minus 3. Okay, if you're ever unsure about those prefixes, and sometimes we see prefixes that aren't all that familiar. In fact, milla, I mean, we've seen a million times over the years, but not really that much this year, right? So, okay, it's kind of in their distant memory. Okay, you're not sure what those prefixes mean, just check that data sheet. It's always there, okay? It's easy to get mixed up on those. It really is, especially between milla and micro for whatever reason, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 3. A lot of people will confuse those two. Okay, yesterday we talked about electric fields. We defined the field, any field, as a line of influence that surrounds something. Specifically, the electric field is the line of influence that surrounds an electric charge. There's two kinds of charges, two kinds of producers that make fields. There's the positive, and there's the negative. They both influence other charges in different directions. 
directions. Therefore, they're vector fields because there is a direction associated with that influence. Now, the two types of, uh, of again, the two types of producers that we have are positive and negative. We define the direction of the electric field as the way that a tiny little positive particle would move if it was placed in the field. I put a little positive particle right there. Which way is it going to move? It's going to move away from the, the uh, positive producer, right? Put one right there. Where is it going to move? Away from it. And so on. So in other words, the electric field will always point away from a positive producer. What if I put a negative in there? Which way is it going to move? Towards it. Does that make the electric field towards the positive now? No, because we define it as the way that a positive would move it placed in the field. What if I do this? What if I take away that positive? I take away that positive. Now the only charge that's there experiencing that field is the negative. Does that make the field in the opposite direction? No. The field is outward away from the positive. Always remember this, guys. The field is there no matter what. The field is caused by the producer. The field is caused by the producer. It doesn't matter what experiences it. The field will always point in the same direction. Now, we define it as the way that a positive would move in place in the field. But the positive doesn't need to be there in order to have the field. It's there pointing away from the positive producer no matter what. Positives will always go with the field. Negatives will always go against the field. Now, if we put a positive particle right there, which way is it going to go? Towards the negative, towards the producer. Same thing right there, same thing right there, and so on and so on. Okay, so the field points toward the negative producer, right? Of course, you guys know the answer to this question. If I put a, a negative right there, sorry, let's put a negative right there, what's going to happen to it? It's going to go away from it. It doesn't change the field, though, right? The field is caused by the producer. We're defining it as toward the producer. It's always going to be now toward that negative producer, no matter what. Positives go with the field. Negatives go against the field. Yep, Travis? I'm sorry? Well, that's a good question, Travis. That's a good question. How do you know which one's the producer? Let's put a little positive right there. How do you know which one's the producer? It's a, it's a good question. Okay, in the end, uh, think about gravity for a second. That's a really good question, actually. Okay, let's think about gravity for a second. Okay, you've got the Earth and you've got you. Which one's the producer? Which one's the experiencer? All depends on context. All depends on context. Okay, the Earth, we would normally assume to be the producer there, right? Because you know, you're a lot smaller and you're clearly experiencing the Earth's gravitational field. But in the end, the Earth is also experiencing your gravitational field. Okay? And in the end, the person next to you is also experiencing your gravitational field. Okay? So it all depends upon the context of the question, which one's the producer, which one's the experiencer. Okay? In the end, there is a field that surrounds this one. It's an experiencer that experiences that, that blue field there. Okay? But it also produces its own field. This charge right here, if we want to call it the experiencer, it would be pushed away from this one. Does that make sense? Just like the Earth is pulled towards you as you're pulled towards the Earth. Okay? So normally we say, look, the small one is the experiencer. But, you know, again, it all depends upon context. Um, every charge is a producer. Every charge is a producer. Now, if it's in somebody else's field, well, it's also an experiencer. And then it depends upon the context of the question, which one we call the producer and which one we call the experiencer. Okay. Let's draw a couple more pictures here. Uh, we drew the picture of uh, the positive, the, the field surrounding the positive and the field surrounding the negative. Let's draw one here where we have a positive and a negative together. Well, the field surrounding the positive looks like this. Surrounding the negative looks like this. What does it look like when these two actually interact with each other, when they get close enough for the fields to actually interact with each other? Well, let's start joining some lines together. The field looks something like that when we have a positive and a negative together. What if we put a positive and a positive together? 
the field goes away from the positive in both cases. What happens here? Well, this time the field lines don't join up. The field lines push each other away. They can't join up because they're going in opposite directions. They push each other away. So what is the net electric field right smack in the middle here between the positive and the positive, assuming that these two are equal charges? Zero. Um, if you put a, a charge, you say you put an object in there, you mean a charge? Okay, if you put a charge, let's say, right here, okay, would it shoot out? Is that what you're asking? Basically, yes. The answer is yes. Um, of course, it all depends upon mass and such. The heavier it is, you know, the, the less it's going to accelerate, right? But in the end, uh, it will experience a force. There's a field. It's an experiencer in that field that will experience a force in the direction of the field, so it will start accelerating. Um, here's a good question. Which way will it accelerate? Is it going to go straight out away from this positive producer like this? What do we say happens to positives? They move with the field. So this positive, if I put it in there, Travis just asked another good question. Is it going to shoot out? Uh, yeah, it's going to shoot kind of out. It's going to shoot like this. If I put one right here, what's going to happen to it? It's going to shoot like this. It follows the path of the field. Does that make sense? But it will accelerate. Yes, it will accelerate. Uh, you know, like big scale uses, you mean? Um, I'm sure there are. Trying to, I'm trying to think of something right now off the top of my head, and I can't. But uh, off the top of my head, but I'm sure there, I'm sure there would be Travis. I'm sure there would be. Um, not so much a use, Travis, but uh, maybe a, you know a, an application where we've seen it. They where we've seen it before. Um, old style TVs like this. You see up in the corner there. Yeah, I remember going to a. Um, a PD session one day, and uh, it was, it was a, a guy that was presenting this stuff on electrostatics. He worked for Nortel. You guys remember Nortel was a big Canadian telecom company and ended up going bankrupt. But at the time, it was, it was huge. It was like one of the largest uh, companies in the world. Um, anyways, uh, I remember him uh, uh, talking to us about uh, a whole bunch of different applications of electrostatics. One of the things he said was um, back when you know, back when uh, computer monitors were always like these CRT TV screens, said you used to see a lot of people, um, you used to see uh, people getting sick, people that would sit in front of these TV screens getting sick, um, you know, sitting in front of these uh, computer monitors all day, you know, at the office, getting sick more often. And people used to think that it was radiation that was coming off of the, of the computer monitor that was, that was making them sick. And he said what they found was actually that it wasn't radiation that was coming off of the computer monitor at all that was making them sick. What it was was that this, the screen was charged negatively. And that's because electrons are fired at the screen, and that's what caused the screen to glow. Right? That's what caused the screen to produce the image that it produced. But he said what they found is that a lot of air pollutants were negatively charged. So those air pollutants that are normally floating everywhere, more or less at rest, now, okay, here's, your, here's your big computer monitor. Okay? These air pollutants kind of just everywhere, right? You're breathing them in, right? Breathing them in like you always do, except when this screen becomes negatively charged, what happens to all these little negative air pollutants? They get repelled right into your face, so you're breathing a higher concentration of them in. Okay, so that's not um, an application that we're trying to do, right, that, you know, some kind of technological application, but it's an implication of exactly what we're talking about right there, right, is the negative experiencers right here get pushed away and accelerate away from the negative producers over here.
And it just happens that your face, of course, is in front of that monitor. So what you used to see a lot of times in offices, actually, because of this, is a lot of people would uh, put these little screens, these little clear screens in front of these monitors. And the idea there was that, look, all these air pollutants right here that are negatively charged, they get pushed away, but then they get stopped by that screen, right? So you're not breathing as many of them in. Okay. See a hand up over here? No? Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at some equations here. You see three equations up on the board right now. All of them relate to gravity, and these, these should look familiar to you. You may not remember exactly these equations, but they should at least look familiar to you. The first one, for gravitational force, right? It's the gravitational force between two objects of a certain mass, a certain distance apart. It's Newton's law of universal gravitation. We talked about that a little bit when we introduced the idea of Coulomb's law, right? F is equal to kq on q2 over r squared. Okay, we compared the two and contrasted the two. Similar structures of equations, right? Both inverse square relationships, differences. Now, Coulomb's law is a lot bigger. Constant is a lot bigger. And this one's only attractive. Coulomb's law is attractive or repulsive. This one is gravitational field. And this is the gravitational field caused by a producer. When you have information about what causes the field, then you would use this equation. So we often use the Earth as an example of a producer, right? We experience the field caused by the Earth. It also experiences the field caused by us, but normally we would say the Earth is the producer because it's so much bigger. If we have information about Earth, the producer, then we're going to use this equation to find the field strength caused by the Earth. The last equation is the gravitational field experienced. If we are experiencing the gravitational field caused by the Earth, and if we have information about the Earth, the producer, then we're going to use the second equation there. If we have information about us, the experiencers, then we're going to use the third equation to find the field strength. Okay, now, the field strength experienced by us is the same as the field strength caused by the Earth. So in the end, if we have information about both us and the Earth, the experiencer and the producer, it doesn't matter which equation you use because you should get the same number. It's the same field. Well, let's extend this now to electricity. The equivalent of the gravitational force equation, in other words, the electric force equation, we've already done, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Looks a lot the same, right? It looks a lot the same. We've already talked about that again, the similarities and the differences. What do you think the equation for electric field caused by a producer might be? I'll give you the symbol. The symbol for electric field is E, with a vector sign over it, by the way. If you just put E, it's not electric field, it's what? Energy. Okay, put the vector sign over it. I don't even care if you forget these absolute value signs. Okay, they should be there. But if you miss the absolute value signs, I'm okay with that. But don't miss the vector sign. I don't want you to miss the vector sign because I promise you this. If you consistently leave off the vector sign, you will mix up energy and electric field at some point. It's not going to happen today, and it's not going to happen tomorrow. You won't get them mixed up today or tomorrow. Okay, but down the road, you will, I promise, mix up energy and electric field if you don't consistently put the, the vector sign over top of it. So don't forget that. What do you think that equation would be? The electric field produced by something. Patrick? Good. It's going to be kq over r squared. r being the distance that separates the producer from the point where you're trying to find the field strength. K being the constant, of course. Q being a charge. Charge of what? Charge of the producer. The charge of whatever it is that's causing the field. Okay. 
And of course, that's going to be in coulombs. Well, what do you think the experiencer equation would be? On your data sheet, it doesn't have the absolute value signs around it for the experiencer equation. Although, to be honest, if it was me, if I made up the data sheet, I would have put it around it. I would have put the absolute value signs there. Because you're still not going to get the direction from that equation. What do you think the experiencer equation would look like here? Go ahead. Yeah. F over Q. F will stand for the force experienced, of course. And that's going to be in Newtons. And Q, it's charge, right? Charge of what? Charge of the experiencer, the charge of the thing that's feeling the field. This goes back to Travis's question that he asked earlier on, the good question about which is the producer, which is the experiencer. How do you know? Again, context. Okay, when you read the question, it's context. Basically, it boils down to this. If you're trying to find the field strength a certain distance away from a charge, then that charge isn't experiencing that field, is it? If you're trying to find, let's, let's go back to the Earth for a second. If you're trying to find the field strength, you're given data about the Earth. The Earth can experience a field, it can produce a field. If you want to find the field strength um, 100 meters above the surface of the Earth, well, the Earth isn't experiencing the field 100 meters above its surface. The Earth is producing that field. So if you're trying to find a field strength a certain distance away from something, it's a producer. If you're trying to find the field strength where the charge is, then it's an experiencer. If you have information about you, Neil, okay, and you want to find the field strength there, okay, then you're not producing that field. Okay, if you have information about you and you want to find the field strength where you are, you're experiencing that field. You also produce a field, but that's not the one we're trying to find, right? Okay. Does that kind of make some sense, guys? Trying to find the field strength a certain distance away. In other words, look, if you're given an R, use the producer equation. If you're not, then use the experiencer equation. Yeah? Yeah? That they would lose charge? No, no, no. Um, it, the question was, uh, if two positives were coming towards each other, is there any point where they'd, they'd become less positive, where they'd kind of lose charge? No. Um, the reason is because it would violate the law of conservation of charge, right? The total charge has to remain the same. If you get plus 5 and plus 5, they come closer and closer together. You can't get discharging from one to the other because they're both positive there, right? They're, so the total charge has to remain 10 between the two. Now, if one was plus 5 and one was plus 7, it's conceivable that charges could jump from one to the other and become plus 6 and plus 6, right? But, but they're not going to overall become less positive, Otherwise, unless there was something else involved that was draining charge from it. But just simply those two things, no, that would never happen. Um, well, no, not, it wouldn't actually. Um, it'd be efficient. The question was, it would be efficient if it was in, if used as an energy source, right? Um, the problem is, not only can you not violate the law of conservation of charge, you can't violate the law of conservation of energy. So, um, you get these two things really, really close together. You guys know, if you get them really, really close together, as R becomes smaller, F becomes bigger, right? So there would be a massive force of repulsion at some point, these two things would push away from each other really, really, really fast and should power something, right? Because these things are going really fast. The problem is, how do you get them that close together? Yeah. Okay, so how do you shoot the proton through it? Okay, a lot of force. So basically, what you're saying is you have to put a lot of force into it to get a lot of force out of it. So, um, would it be an efficient transformation of energy? It probably actually would be a fairly efficient transformation of energy, but you still wouldn't get more out of it than you put into it, right? 
That makes sense? Okay, let's take a look at, uh, I think I got two examples that I want to do with you here today. Both fairly straightforward, I think. First one, 11.1 on 548. Notice we're in chapter 11 here now. If you don't have that one, download that one tonight. The sphere with a negative charge, a negative charge, as soon as I see that, I want to circle that in red, right? Of 2.1 times 10 to the minus 6 experiences a force of repulsion of this much when it's placed in an electric field produced by a source charge. Figure whatever, we don't care about the picture. Determine the magnitude of the field the source charge produces at this sphere. Okay. Um, what do we got going on here? We got a negative charge. Okay, that's going to be Q. We've got a force. We've got a source charge. Is that the charge? Is this charge right here the charge of the source charge? No, it's not, is it? No. Okay, we want to find the field strength caused by this source charge. We don't know anything about this source charge. We want to, when we read this question, use the producer equation. E is equal to kq over r squared. But my problem is, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about the producer. But I do know something about the experiencer. This negative charge, neg 2.1 times 10 to the neg 6, experiences that field. Let's find the field strength experienced by that charge. 5.60 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons divided by 2.10 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Again, guys, I'm just I'm dropping the sign of the charge there. I always do when I plug it into an equation. What do I end up getting there? 26,666. Um, or we're going to say 2.67 times 10 to the 4. Hey, what would the units be for that, by the way? F over Q. What is it? Somebody said it. Newtons per coulomb. Well, that's the field strength that's experienced by this guy right here. That's not what I want, right? I want the field strength that's caused by this one at that sphere. Isn't it the same thing? Okay, what gravitational field do you experience right now? What's the value of the field that you experience right now? What does it matter? 9.81. What's the field strength caused by the Earth where you are? 9.81. The field strength that you experience okay, is the same as the field strength that's caused by the Earth at the point where you are. Okay, that's the same question, right, except it's electricity instead of gravitational fields. The field strength experienced at that point is the same as the field strength that's produced by source charge at that point. Is that okay? Again, Travis goes back to your question again. Context. Does this produce, does this guy right here produce a field? Yes. But in the context of this question, it's experiencing the field caused by this one, right? All right. Let's take a look at a couple practice questions on page 548. Yep. Give you uh, a couple of minutes to work on those. We'll do one more example, and then we'll wrap it up for the day here. All right, if we're not in any troubles with those questions, let's take a look at one more example, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. 11.2 on 549. Determine the electric field at position P that is 2.20 times 10 to the 2 meters from its center of a negative point charge 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. Is this charge a producer or experiencer? Well, the reality is it's both, right? In this context, is it a producer or experiencer? We're trying to find the field strength a certain distance away from this charge. It's a producer. It can't be experiencing a field somewhere other than where it is. You don't experience something if you're not there to experience it. So it's a producer. We're going to use the producer equation. This is R. This is going to be Q. Okay, the producer equation, KQ over R squared. Okay. 
What do we get when we do that? 3.16 times 10 is 7. Anybody else get that? Yes? What are the units for this? Kind of looks kind of wacky to find out the units for this, right? But in the end, look, if you like to feel this Newton's per coulomb, you like to feel this Newton's per coulomb. Doesn't matter what equation we use, right? Still Newton's per coulomb. Now, we, we could get those units out of this equation as well. K is Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Q is coulombs. R squared is meter squared. Cancel out the meter squared. Cancel out one of the coulombs. What are we left with? Still Newtons per coulomb, right? So it works out. All right, your homework. The last set of questions, if you didn't finish them, and then these set of questions on page 549 as well. Finish them up in class, have no homework. Uh, if you don't finish them up in class, then let's make sure they're done for tomorrow, please. That's it for today.